Are aliens actually humans from the future? Well, today's guest believes so. I mean, many of us grew up with the movie Back to the Future. Why not Future to the Past? Dr. Mike Masters, who's going to be part of the Contact in the Desert speaker series, will be talking about time travel and human evolution, a scientific approach to the UFO phenomenon. This theory can answer all our UFO questions. I'm your host, Tony Sweet. Please welcome to the Truth Be Told studios for the first time, Dr. Michael Masters. There he is. My twin brother, they say. (laughs) Well, actually, the better looking twin brother, so. Brother of another mother. Right. Well, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Mike. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, it's good to see you again. I think we met in uh, Irvine, California. Yeah, it was like, yeah. Uh, th- two, Couple, three years ago. Two years ago, yeah. Yeah, before it was the fiftieth MUFON. Before the uh, craziness conference. happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little did we know it was about to get crazy. Well, you know, uh, a lot has happened. You know, like I said, in the UFO world, we're starting to hear even government starting to acknowledge and you know releasing documents and so many different things. Um, that uh, people like us have been talking about for a long time, and it's kind of validating mm-hmm. what we're, you know, what we're seeking. And yeah. another thing that uh, that we're seeking is time travel. And uh, I'll just get right into it because um, many times that we used to talk about UFOs coming to the, you know this planet, and and um, and then it started making sense. It's like, well. That's a long ways to go if it's just flying across the universe. But there has to be, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, Avengers, all these different, you know, futuristic movies in Hollywood that use time travel to show how they get from one point to the other in different universes, different galaxies. And um, it started making sense of that's how people are getting from one place to the other but i find i found it fascinating that bringing up the possibility of humans in the future are mm-hmm. coming back to visit us first of all how did how did that theory thought become something that you wanted to research and and look look at yeah well it, it started for me when i was uh, about 8 years old and i saw uh, Willie Strieber's book communion up on our living room shelf. <laughs> my, uh, my old man had a, a UFO encounter before I was born. So Willie's book is one of the first ones to really, uh, tackle the question of, of aliens and especially abductions. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I just remember looking up at that book and having this, uh, this mental image flash across my mind of a early hominin, <laughs> a modern human. And then this archetypal alien form and just kind of wondered if if we could be related we share a lot of common characteristics and if you look at our evolutionary past the most dominant trends are an increase in neurocranial globularity and Mm -hmm. cephalization throughout the last six to eight million years a reduction in our facial prognathism our faces have shrunk back considerably throughout that time there's this trade-off between the brain and the face right um, so yeah, if these same trends continue into the future, regardless of whether we live in space or on the moon or underground or anything, we're likely to still have those cranial facial characteristics, also more advanced technology, possibly the ability to go back in time. So just kind of putting all of that together back in 2012, I decided to write this book and approach it from a multidisciplinary standpoint, combining my field of anthropology with astrobiology, astronomy, and physics to make a case for this time travel model. Well, a lot of scientists, they, you know, everything needs to be fact and proven or a theory that, that can be, can be proven even though it's not yet, but they don't necessarily believe, you know, in the afterlife or UFOs or anything like that. So what, what makes you different when it comes to 
uh, your your theories and your thoughts where maybe your colleagues are like, oh, little cuckoo here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's always the risk you run in writing about UFOs or studying consciousness or really any of these taboo topics. But Im importantly, this is a testable model. Uh, right. And it's falsifiable simply by time itself. If we continue to exist, this model predicts that we will eventually become them will be the ones traveling through time and space in these uh, metallic discs, strangular craft. Um, and we'll be the ones with the, the big heads, the small faces, the relative hairlessness, the more advanced technology. Um, so it, even if we die, even if we wipe ourselves out or are exterminated by some outside force, we've still tested this theory and falsified it essentially. So I think beginning in a place that's not rooted in the extraterrestrial hypothesis mm -hmm. and, and comes from a place where we're developing actual testable and falsifiable hypotheses sort of lends more credence to this uh, area of investigation as we see it uh, based, based on the scientific method. What was some of the first things that you discovered or people that you researched that, that started proving the points that you're trying to to give to the world uh, because so many of us again we're we're seeking these answers and you know we don't have the ability to have access to many you know archives and and research and anything yeah. like that but what what was what was some of the people and some of the first researches that you found was like you know this 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 can make a huge difference in hum humanity going forward yeah, it is unfortunate that a lot of our research remains behind a paywall. Um, it, the whole journal industry is kind of crap uh, to start with. We, we don't get paid as researchers for uh, journal articles. We are required to uh, do research as part of our tenure and promotion process and, and publish or perish as this idiom within academia. But uh, the, the publishing companies make an exorbitant amount from these articles and we get nothing from them other than getting our research out. But there's right. no monetary compensation. And so, yeah, it's unfortunate that they're behind a paywall and people don't have access to uh, cutting edge research that's published in a lot of these these journals. Um, and, and that is kind of changing to some extent. There's more open source, uh, open access publications. But yeah, for me, I guess it was, um, I mean, early on, I, I was really interested in this question. Like I s said before, I was around eight years old mm -hmm. when this thought occurred to me. And I went to our the library at my high school and got every book we had on human evolution, which was two, two books on human evolution. And they weren't very good. It was mostly pictures, and um, but it you know it started that that quest to understand uh, hominin evolution for me, biocultural change, and especially getting into paleoanthropology and the the physical aspects of our evolution. Uh, hominin evolutionary anatomy was a big focus of my research and continues to be. So yeah, I mean, you've got your more mainstream scientists like Richard Dawkins mm -hmm. and um, uh, Donald Johansson, who discovered Lucy in the 1970s, Australopithecus afarensis, and others. So yeah, as I got into anthropology as an undergraduate, I was naturally exposed to more esoteric research and um, really started to, to really solidify some of these things not just in my mind, but just really things that made sense. And there's there's been this odd synchronicity too that's occurred throughout my life where I'll I'll be writing about something and I'll just happen to come across an article that's extremely relevant to the point I was making. And and that seems to happen more and more in uh in my recent writing and recent research. Perhaps because I'm paying more attention to it. I don't know, but it's been a it's been a really all pervasive omnipresent aspect of uh, my own area of study with regard to UFO phenomenon. So when we hear a lot about uh, alien um, uh, species, you know, we hear that, you know, the, the grays and the, you know, the reptilians and, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. Um, 
if the a lot of the alien life is is our future um uh, our future humans why would they come in a a different form such as uh different types of aliens that look nothing like us why would why well, why was your theory why would what would your theory say to that yeah most of them do actually look like us uh the majority of them in fact and um i've, I've cited this study a few times but the dr edgar mitchell foundation free study mm -hmm. showed that the majority i think it was 51 or 52 percent uh, even though in the actual um uh, survey question, they referred to them as non-human intelligences, uh, asking if people had contact with a non-human intelligence. And I go into this in more detail in my Contact in the Desert workshop, uh, kind of break apart some aspects of that study and, and many things related to your question, the, the variation among these forms. Um, but what they found is the majority are described as human, even though the survey question asked if people had seen non-human entities. And then after that, the next most common was the tall grays, the right. short grays. And then you only get into about 5% that are described as reptilian or insect-like in some way. So what I attribute this to is what I refer to as temporal ancestry mm -hmm. in the same way that, uh, you know, we were talking about our ancestry before we started recording here, where I'm primarily Welsh. My ancestors came from that particular part of uh, Europe. Um, but you have other ancestral groups, Sub-Saharan African, Native American, Australian Aborigine, and so on. Uh, in the same way that we have these geographic variants, you might have temporal variants where people that are coming back from different times, the farther you get from our particular position in time right now, you're going to have more different variants. They're going to have more accentuated uh, characteristics because they've had more time to evolve in the same right. way that if I went back a hundred years into the past, I'm going to look just like people at that time. I go back 200,000 years into the past or a million years into the past, the farther back I go, the more different I look from those individuals. And interestingly, I'm the one that has relative hairlessness, big head, big <laughs> eyes, small face, right. more advanced technology. I would appear very similar to how these beings are described, um, in modern day reports. Yeah, that's 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 truly fascinating. I mean, because we're also discovering not only, you know, ancient civilizations, we're also constantly discovering new human type of species. So I find that fascinating that, you know, our past can sometimes talk about our future uh, where it shows, like you said, the evolution of what humans could be how far in advance do you think that these humans are well again i think it depends on what which ones we're talking about right. the ones that are described as entirely human that speak vocally in the same way that we do may only be from 100 300 years in our future uh, whenever we crack the code on backward time travel and have the materials and the engineering skills to construct these machines mm -hmm. uh, we might expect to see people from our future as soon as that happens. Um, if we're talking about other individuals, Jim, Jim Penniston didn't get a chance to see the beings that he interacted with. And in some reports they described the more childlike, big headed type of beings. But um, through the binary code that was later interpreted, uh, it's, it, it came out to be about 8,000 years in the hmm. future, I think. If we're talking oh, wow. about the tall grays, um, the ones that uh, do seem to have more non-human traits, even though they're still human in every sense of the word, they share these hominin characteristics. Uh, those those are likely from a much more distant point in our future, possibly tens of thousands of years. It's it's kind of hard to say. It really just depends on which ones we're talking about. So, how many do you think are are from different galaxies or universes or different planets? Do you feel that there are? different species out there uh, besides just future humans like extraterrestrials yes um yeah i mean i don't consider that hypothesis to be off the table at all um it, it's certainly a possibility and it, it's intuitive too it makes sense for really from the first instances of contact or sightings with these things that arguably go back 
uh, tens of thousands of years as well, as indicated by prehistoric cave paintings and carvings and things like that. This phenomenon seems to have been with us for a very long time. Uh, we see them coming down from the sky. So naturally we would assume, oh, those must be from the stars. Those came right. from outer space. Uh, so, so the extraterrestrial hypothesis is intuitive. It makes sense. We can understand why that's been the dominant model for so long. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's really unlikely that you're going to get anything resembling a hominin or a primate or any earthly creature on a planet that has a different gravity distance from its sun, different right. chemical composition, different atmosphere, uh, maybe silicone based instead of carbon based. It may not have anything that resembles DNA, which just happens to be the molecular nucleotide coding system for all life on this planet. So, um, it, you know, and then there's issues with regard to how they would find us, how they would travel here, which you mentioned uh, in the start of the show. It's just, it, it seems like there's a lot of things that would have to be overcome in order for us to be visited by very human looking extraterrestrial beings. So I think the sort right. of in an Occam's razor context, the most parsimonious explanation, since we know we're here and we know we've had this long history on this planet with more advanced technology, the simpler explanation seemingly is that it's just us, but I, I definitely don't discount that there could be life on other planets. I think it's almost uh, guaranteed considering how quickly life started here on earth. Once we had liquid water and, and, and right. atmosphere. Um, Egypt, you know, Machu Picchu, many other ancient sites, uh, especially in Egypt, there's a lot of, you know, hieroglyphs of, Potentially, quote, quote, um, in fact, I'm interviewing a Chinese uh, ufologist after this, where there's a lot of um, hieroglyphs, sculptures that look very alien-like. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that Egypt and some of these ancient sites were visited by our future to help them in, uh, enhance or give them technology to survive? And do you think that might happen to us where they might finally, we might present ourselves to each other um, and so we can survive climate change or whatever you, whatever else is, you know, risking the world? Yeah, I mean, I think there's already indications that they have been doing that to some extent with their constant monitoring <clears throat> and interventions uh, with regard to our nuclear arsenal right um just not far from where i live in montana uh is the malmstrom air force base which was completely shut down um i don't remember exactly when that was in the 70s i think and there's been other instances as well and who knows if that was done because they knew that something was malfunctioning and mm -hmm. they saved us from some sort of nuclear holocaust it's it's hard to tell and that kind of gets into issues with with paradoxes and whether if they did avert some catastrophe that they knew was going to happen and mm -hmm. did happen then how did they know to do that if it never happened um and, and that matters in the context of the the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and having different timelines in the context of block time it, those paradoxes sort of fade away they don't exist when you have the self-consistency that's inherent uh among events in the block universe um, but no, I don't, I don't think they intervened. There seems to be sort of this Star Trekian prime directive where it seems to be more about observation and sort of covert activities outside of abductions where they physically take people and uh, have a much closer interaction. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the people of those times could have easily done the things they did. In fact, that's part of the stepping stone to where we got and our own knowledge of engineering and, and irrigation and things like that. So I think they were definitely visited. I, I think if people at some point in the future develop backward time travel technology, they're going to visit and study as many time periods as they can as far back into the past as they can go. So if we see them now, I think we're almost guaranteed that if they can reach those periods that deep into the past that they're going to go there um, or have gone there, depending on whether you're looking at it from a future or past perspective. But I don't think there was widespread intervention. They certainly didn't build the pyramids or Machu Picchu or anything like that. But there are cultural indicators that 
those groups had many groups throughout the world had been visited for a very long time, such as cave paintings and carvings and hieroglyphs and things like that. As we, I mean, if you're an Avenger fan, <laughs> uh, I just watched it for the first time. Uh, what did you last think of week? It? We're, we're doing the whole Marvel series from start to finish right now. So what, what, which one are you on right now? Uh, I think we just finished Iron Man three or no guardians of the galaxy oh, okay so you still have a ways to go i don't want to oh yeah we're just getting started yeah i don't want to ruin anything but uh but it does it does show and they even you know reference this when they figured out that you know the infinity stones and being able to time travel and and but th they were very careful about changing time changing yeah. the past because it could affect the future even more chaotic than it happened the first time around i mean how let's say we get that advancement wouldn't that possibility of of us really maybe even destroying our our future before we before we even get there yeah i mean again that kind of comes down to whether you're looking at it through the block universe model or some some multiverse model the brain right. the woven the expanding right. or the quantum multiverse the many worlds interpretation as i mentioned and in that instance it's thought that if you go back in time you create quantum decoherence and you split the timeline into separate entities and and in, in that scenario you do have the potential for more paradoxes the issue of how do they get back to their timeline um it, what's different about this timeline how would they have known to change anything and, and many of those consistency paradoxes start to come into play but in the context of the block universe model and especially i drew from the work of igor novikov uh, and the novikov self-consistency principle where you have this inherent uh self-preserved consistency among events and a good way to think of it is if you went back in time in this block universe model, anything that you did in that past, any change as we consider it, has already manifested itself before you ever left to go to the past. It's already oh, wow. become a part of that future that you're leaving from right. simply because of this inherent self-consistency among events. So anything that you are going to do in visiting the past, you've already done and those effects have already uh, come to fruition before you left to do them. So. I, I mostly stuck with the block universe model for my own research. Um, and it is the most dominant model within the physics community as well. And it seems to make the most sense, especially compared to some of these multiverse models. Right, right. However, I would like to point out that when people talk about interdimensional entities, I, I consider that a part of this same model, that they're still humans. They're just coming from one of these multiverses or one of these timelines um as opposed to being part of the block universe and coming from our own timeline in the block uh, universe model so when people it's kind of become a buzzword oh they're interdimensional they don't say what they are they're just talking about the means with which they travel but if we're talking about interdimensional humans i consider that the same model as this extra tempestrial model so what how far off are we or to time travel i mean i've heard for many years like oh we're really close and we're we're, we're starting to understand it better um yeah. and you know because that's that's also a dangerous a, a dangerous um road to go down because if you do scientifically do something wrong this could affect us now i mean like almost like a nuclear explosion or black hole or something i mean yeah. how how dangerous is it and how close are we i mean in order to warp space time to the extent that you can create closed time like curves it's going to take a lot of mass or most likely energy and probably uh electromagnetic uh the, the electromagnetic force especially considering and, and with regard to the propulsion system as well right. it seems um that that force is a big part of how these craft fly, considering that electromagnetic force is 10 to the 40 times stronger than gravity. If we're right. talking about repelling the gravitational force, that seems like a pretty good way to do it. But I also think it's going to be involved in the creation of these closed timeline curves and allowing us the opportunity to go back in time. 
Um, there's a, a couple of things that stand in our way currently. We don't yet understand how quantum mechanics jives with general relativity, and we'll need some theory, uh, all encompassing theory that melds those two, a theory of quantum gravity, essentially. And um, I, I don't think we have the materials necessary or the engineering abilities yet. But once we once we have the proper materials and that understanding of the interplay between quantum mechanics and general relativity, I think we're going to be there pretty soon. Um, and especially if a time machine crashed into Roswell in 1947, and we can draw from that information that came from the future at a time when they have this technology available to them and they're using it to visit the past. If that was in fact future humans that crashed a time machine, then we were gifted knowledge of how that works. And and again, that, that seems like a paradox, but it's not because this machine helped create itself. And, and the thing that bothers people is that there's no true creator. The people in the past didn't create it because it was gifted to them in this crash. People in the future didn't create it because it's the result of the reverse engineering. And that doesn't sit well with people, but there's right. nothing inherently paradoxical about that. You can have things that have always existed that don't really have a true origin or a true creator. Um, so I think if, if that was a time machine and we've been working on figuring this out since 1947, we could be within 50 or 100 years of cracking that code. Some people think that we've, you know, already have the potential of time travel. Um, I mean, even the the Nazis, you tried to do the, you know, the the bell, the Nazi bell time machine. Do you feel that even in the past we've come close um, before and just kind of thought it was too mm -hmm. dangerous? Or do you feel that it was just, you know, wishful thinking? Yeah, I mean, you've got... Um the Integratron too. His name eludes me right now. Even yeah, I look it up. But yeah. talked about him on an Ancient Aliens episode for like an hour one day. Um, starts with a T. I remember that. George um, Van no, Tessel. I don't, I don't, what was it? George Van Tessel. Yeah, yeah, George Van Tessel. Um, so yeah, there's been attempts. I know Nikola Tesla um, sort of toyed around with it for a while, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't think it's probably happened yet. I think those limitations that I mentioned are going to keep us from really being able to take control of space time in that way. But I, I really don't think we're too far from it. Um, I think it'll potentially maybe even happen in our lives, at least sending particles back in time. And, and really, we're already time traveling. Every time you get on an airplane, or anytime astronauts go into space, they're they're traveling through time based on um, special relativity. And I guess in that case, general relativity, how close to the earth you are modifies the rate at which time passes. So when you're up in a plane or you're high above uh, the earth and space, time's going just a little bit faster right. uh, simply because you don't have that slowing of time uh, closer to the gravitational field of earth. So. Um, yeah, backward time travel is a harder nut to crack, but uh, humans have demonstrated throughout the ages that if there's nothing that keeps something from being physically impossible, we're probably going to eventually figure out a way to do it. So Einstein brought that up, you know, with E equals MC squared about time travel. In his research and his theory... <laughs> Because I'm I'm not a science major, so so I'm I'm looking at it from just a a man on the street. But when when he brought that to the table, how did that change humanity and the potential of time travel? Was he the one that really kind of put us in the direction of potential? Yeah, I mean, he put us in the direction of a lot of things. Right. We moved from Newtonian physics to our, our current understanding of, of classical physics, I guess. But um, it really, it was his, his first paper on special relativity that showed us that time and space are relative to the speed of light and your movement relative to the speed of light with special relativity. But then in 1915, he published a paper on general relativity and showed how uh, the warpage of space-time exists in the, the presence of large 
bodies, uh, even even planets, a small planet like Earth, right, has been shown to uh, create that same sort of space time warpage. Obviously, black holes warp space to the extent that light can't even escape, and that indicates that you're going back in time as you move into uh, a black hole. But really, it was the the ten field equations he published in association with that 1915 paper that almost instantly you had people solving these equations and demonstrating that you can create uh, closed time like curves, you can modify the rate at which time passes and possibly move backward into the global past right. through um, consistently the spinning of a massive, rapidly spinning, uh, massive or highly energetic ring, sphere, and even disk. In the 1970s, Frank Tipler showed that if you compress these cylinders that are spinning at a high speed down to a finite uh, size, you get a disk that's capable of creating closed timeline curves. And interestingly, that's how many of these UFOs are described as a rotating, highly electromagnetic, um, highly energetic disk. So it really, it, it, in the context of how form follows function, in many cases, you can see how the form of these craft may indicate that they have the function of traveling backward in time. Yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, I just, this, anything time travel uh, fascinates me because I think since the beginning of time, humans have always had this, you know, the stars have meant so much to us. I mean, you know, how we build and how we see things and, you know, yeah. even air flights and, you know, how uh, it's, kind of we we base a lot off 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 of, off of our astrology and stuff like that so um yeah and somebody in the chat room i was going to ask anybody in the chat room if you guys my co-host if you guys want to leave a, a question or have a question for dr masters uh we'd love to 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 talk to uh, talk to him from you but uh but somebody says about visitations a lot of people there's millions of people that have had vi visitations i've talked to people in um in the navajo nation saying that they see mm -hmm. ufos all the time they've you know interacted with visit uh, visitors from outer space and star people and you know even when i was a kid we saw a ufo and very pretty up close and a lot of people have seen these things so what do you say to those people that say that uh, these these weren't humans these were something from out they you know out of this world that was not from human they you know they talked to me through their t telepathy not verbal um what what do you say to all the sightings and the visitations of people even abductions why would we need why would we want to abduct our own people right um yeah, I mean, to the last point, it's I, I think most of it has to do, well, I think it's largely centered on two things. Um, one is what they do is very similar to what I would do as a paleoanthropologist. Mm -hmm. If I had access to this technology, I would pick people up, I would examine them, uh, teeth, skin, toenail trimmings, take fecal samples, you can get a lot of information from fecal matter, about someone's diet, metabolism, things like that. So there seems to be some sort of research-based aspect of this, and I have to acknowledge my own bias as a physical anthropologist, but it, it does sort of, it's reminiscent of what I would do if I had this technology, instead of just looking at fossilized bones and teeth, we could get the whole picture of our physiology and also our culture, our language, we can learn those things. Um, but there's also a huge focus on gamete extraction, mm -hmm. taking sperm from men, eggs from females, even developing fetuses is very common across these abduction reports. So there seems to be some indication that they're having problems with reproduction. They're doing this for their own good to help with some issues. And I talk in great detail in the book about based on current trends alone, not just speculating about what might happen in the future. But based on current trends, what some of those problems may be, largely related to demographic shifts, increases in infertility, reduced sperm right. counts in men, genetic homogenization brought about through global incest because we've become one interbreeding uh, population on this island of Earth. So, so I think that helps account for the abduction aspect, both research and 
uh, gamete extraction to help with reproduction. Um, but yeah, these visitations, there, there is variation, and I acknowledge that in the book. But I, again, I think these ones where they're actually non-human, they're described in very non-human terms, those are outliers. The, the vast majority are described as human or human-like or humanoid. Many are described as looking East Asian, Oriental, as they're referred to as the, of the Nordic. So I think th this variation as both an aspect of our continued geographic variance, where we have people from Norwegian countries, we have mm -hmm. people from East Asia, but also that temporal ancestry, like I mentioned earlier in the show, where if they're coming back from different times, we would expect them to look different and more different from us if they're coming back from a more distant point in the future. But we definitely shouldn't dismiss this variation, but we should recognize that, that based on the free study and, and others, that most are human and we should acknowledge the outliers, but not necessarily base our entire ter interpretation of the phenomenon around those. Somebody was in the chat room saying that, uh, and I, and this is something that is valid. Um, back in, you know, when we started testing the atomic and nuclear bombs, um, did that affect time, uh, time itself? And I mean, we'll, we can even go back when the dinosaurs were, uh, just, you know, wiped off this planet with the asteroid. Could something of that caliber change a little bit of time? Um, I, I don't see, I don't necessarily think that just exploding atomic and hydrogen bombs would mm -hmm. really change the flow of time all that much. Um, if we did accidentally create a singularity in a lab, that, that could certainly have some impact. Um, but I think it's also important to note just the focus on nuclear weapons. And, and that kind of makes more sense in the context of future humans who are stakeholders mm -hmm. on in this planet. That if they are us in the future, they don't want us to destroy ourselves because right. that means they wouldn't exist. Uh, but they also don't want to live on a planet that is tainted by nuclear fallout, which lasts for a, a very, very long time and could affect them directly. So it doesn't seem like extraterrestrials would necessarily care what we're doing to our planet, but people who are stakeholders in the same Earth might. Um, there's also that story, who knows if it's true or not, of I think Eisenhower being visited right. and being told to stop testing nukes because you're screwing up the planet. Uh, Again, if that did happen, it's sort of indicative of um, people who care about the planet. And um, yeah, I, I think soon after that allegedly took place, we stopped carrying out as many tests as we did. So who knows you know, if that's true or not. But um, yeah, I think the, the nuclear UFO relationship is, is certainly worthy of study. And somebody else, and, and you know, I don't know if this we can. You have an answer for this, but they they say a lot of abdu abductions. They they hear that it's to deal with blood types. I don't know if you have anything, um, any knowledge about that. But yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. I hadn't really yeah, heard, I haven't that, heard that. Yeah, I haven't heard that one either. It it could be they do seem to focus on individual families and groups, mm -hmm. and and as I explain in the book, that may have something to do with these genes being novel variants in the future if they're groups that didn't make it in to the future gene pool and they need new gene variants to help with the situation of incest and genetic homogenization, it would make sense that they focus on individuals and individual families who are part of those haplogroups that didn't persevere into the future. On the astronomy side, why, why do you think it's important for humans to go to Mars and Venus and colonize the moon and why I mean I always say why try to create a civilization on, on another planet when we should be fixing and working on our own yeah I um, mean it, it, it does kind of give us a, a backup plan I guess right. to some extent the tragedy of the commons would seem to indicate that we're never going to be able to stave off global warming or pollution or it, it's right. just eventually going to ruin this planet. So yeah, that sucks. Um, and we should probably look inward more than outward. But I, I think beyond that, we're just naturally curious. We want to know what we can do. Uh, for so long, we saw the moon sitting up there and said, how do we get there? Let's right. see if we can do it. I think it proves something to us as a society and as a species that we can 
uh, reach for the stars. I mean, that idiom alone indicates that we're constantly trying to reach out and go farther and faster and be the first to do it. There's the, the space race, this arms race. We've always sort of been competing with other nations to show us the best technology right. and <laughs> who can go into space first. So it, maybe that'll continue as well. It's a big part of, of why we're doing it. It's sort always, of space machismo, I guess you could say. It's always that competition that pushes us to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, you have about 10 minutes left. I'm just going to take a quick break because we actually need to promote uh, Contact in the Desert. So uh, uh, Dr. Michael Masters is going to be speaking at Contact in the Desert. Get your tickets. It's virtual this year. And uh, we're going to come back. We're going to talk about a book. Not only has a book out now, but he has a book coming up uh, in probably 2022. And uh, we'll be right back. Uh, this is Truth Be Told. I'm Tony Sweet. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> When you start to ask the question, it unfolds the fabric of space itself, how it's made. What is it made of? We're not alone in this universe. We never have been. Alien intelligences have cohabited with us on this planet for millions of years. We inherited the obsession from the Anunnaki. Anyone that still thinks that we're the ones that are obsessed with gold does not know enough about the true history of our species, how we came to be here, and the conditions that brought us here. We are not unique in this universe. Extraterrestrials do exist. We are, so to say, the copies of them. back. I'm Tony Sweet with Dr. Mike Masters. As you can see, he's going to be at Contact in the Desert for a virtual event June 25th through the 28th. He's going to be doing a lecture and a workshop. You can get your tickets um, online and make sure you get them soon because it's coming up very quickly and uh, tickets are selling out. So get them now. And uh, what are you going to be talking about? Kind of what we're going over tonight? Because we didn't want to give everything away, because we want to have something left to. <laughs> yeah, there'll be some, uh, there'll be some, some surprise revelations, I guess. <laughs> um, just different, different ways of looking at this model. Um, d new, new ways of approaching the question uh, of UFOs and, and time travel as a possible explanation for it. Some limitations of other interpretations, but also acknowledging that we don't know uh, and we won't fully know until they reveal themselves and tell us who they are and where or, or when they're from. But just what we can what we can deduce based on um, current knowledge within the fields of physics, astronomy, astro uh, anthropology, astrobiology, psychology, economics, uh, all of these things, I think, are important. And then, yeah, in the workshop, uh, it, it focuses more on the research for my new book, which um, whereas the first book was more based on these fields and, and how we might understand the UFO phenomenon based on our knowledge of human evolution, the Drake equation, Fermi's paradox, um, time physics, time travel, um, but only a little bit of mention of actual abductions or close encounters. This next book kind of flips that and focuses more on uh, well-known and lesser-known instances of mm. close contact and mostly abductions in the context of not just this extra tempestrial model, but also the extraterrestrial hypothesis, ultra-terrestrials, simulation hypothesis, oh, interdimensional, and all of these other um, ways of, of understanding this phenomenon. So it kind of draws from those and evaluates these different models in the context of what people report seeing and, and experiencing. And what do you when do you think that's coming up? Well, uh, I actually have been making some good progress this week, which gives me hope that it will <laughs> eventually be finished. Um, <laughs> but a good yeah, I, I think probably late twenty twenty one, early twenty twenty two is the projected release for that one. That'll be a good um, time. It's, it's been yeah. fun. It's been a lot of fun to write, and um, you know, you do the first the first round of writing, you're like, oh, this is crap. Hey, this, why am I doing it? But <laughs> right. now I'm in like the third round of editing and I, I feel like it's uh, it's going to be 
pretty decent book. I'm excited about it. All right, we, we I'm going to take one more question, uh, and it's uh, Alan from the chat room. And actually, this is a good one. So if you can shed some light on this. Could a UFO be probes from other advanced civilizations or even our future? And could our souls be an energy commodity in the universe? Yeah, I think there's we're kind of shifting more Thanks, toward a, a broader knowledge of consciousness and this this idea of panpsychism where th there's just consciousness pervading the universe right. and all these different life forms and we share this kind of common connection with um with other beings and and it almost seems like these uh extra tempestrials as i call them these visitors in whatever way we understand them uh have a mastery of consciousness and mm -hmm. and that's i think a big part of where this ultra terrestrial idea comes from um and, and yeah the fact that they can communicate telepathically indicates that they have sort of tapped into this thing that we don't yet understand some people seemingly have the ability to uh, exhibit precognition telepathy just a deeper understanding that not everybody has which may be in all of us we just haven't trained ourselves to do that um but yeah i think i think there's something to be said for for that as an aspect of the phenomenon i don't think we can really truly understand ufos without understanding consciousness and especially how consciousness seems to transcend time and space people that have near-death experiences once they leave their physical form uh consistently across these reports say they have the ability to see through time to move instantly wherever they want and um that, that would indicate that that there is this divide between our conscious self and right. this physical meat fleshy thing we carry around uh to house it so, so yeah, I think it's an aspect of the phenomenon. I definitely think that probes are an aspect of it. The Tic Tac very well could have been some sort of drone sent from the future for research purposes. It doesn't seem like all of these craft have physical occupants. Um, many of them are described in association with these beings, but uh, yeah, especially early on in testing backward time travel technology, you're not going to get a human to climb in that thing. You're going to probably use AI you're right. going to pre-program everything like at this point astronauts don't even fly spacex jets anymore they just push a button and boom it goes up there and does right. everything so uh, it's likely that that'll be involved in early time travel technology as well um and and could be an aspect of what we see in the skies today i mean i definitely wouldn't volunteer for the first go no. around <laughs> no that i mean i know a few people after a few beers maybe but they <laughs> yeah i mean jody foster did and and what was that contact oh but, yeah uh, that was a good movie yeah it was a great movie I, i'm not as brave as jody foster though no. well, she also busted up in on that uh wasn't that her in silence of the lambs oh yeah 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 she's yeah. very brave and i, in I wouldn't have done that either films. yeah but maybe for 20 million dollars i probably would at least give it a thunk yeah yeah or at least go into a studio and pretend i did it right i mean that's what acting is <laughs> right. um well okay one last question we'll get you out of here but um <clears throat> do you think the 2012 there seemed to be and i hear i've worked with a lot of psychics and mediums and they talk about the shift the inner dimensions or you know the layers are getting thinner um and a lot more people are coming and coming in with um you know, star children and indigo children. Do you feel like these? this is the beginning of that next generation or next evolution of, of men or humans? I won't use men, but humans uh, that might have that ability to, for telepathy and more advanced in, in the mind? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly seems like we're trending in that direction. Uh, there, there seems to be kind of an ebb and flow where humanity seems woke for a while and then we revert to the stone ages for a while. But right. it, it, each part of that process, we seem to be inching toward uh, a greater understanding of, of, of who we are, uh, not just our physical evolutionary mm -hmm. form, but our minds, our, our being, our soul, our consciousness. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know much about that, if there was when it started or why, but just with everything that's happening now, it seems like we're kind of spiraling toward a greater understanding of a lot of things. So yeah, I'd, I'd definitely be on board with entertaining that thought. All right. Well, 
Everybody's going to get a chance to uh, hear more details about what we talked about today, time travel, future hu humans coming back and, and observing and possibly even, you know, giving us a kick in the butt, which we need sometimes as parents do with their children. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you're going to get to see Dr. Mike Masters, Michael Masters at Contact in the Desert. Uh, you got June 25th through 28th. I think that's what, two weeks away. So, yeah, uh, it's coming up. I know it's get your tickets. But you also can go to michaelpmasters.com, uh, check out his website, and then uh, get ready for his uh, second book coming out hopefully at the end of this year or 2022. And uh, but uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mike. We really appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, thanks, Tony. It's always good to talk to you. Appreciate you it. too. All right. Well, this is Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told. We appreciate you guys for tuning in. Please subscribe, leave a comment, share this show if you can. We'd always uh, appreciate you guys being part of the Truth Be Told fam family and uh, everybody in the chat room. Thanks for the questions. And we'll see you next time right here on Truth Be Told. <laughs>